Hi everyone, Dr. Simon Fry, consultant in clinical neurophysiology here. This video is going to focus very specifically about piriformis syndrome. The previous video, which I would encourage all of you to watch, is the deep gluteal syndrome a group of conditions which piriformis syndrome is one of quite a number of potential causes of that. And really it's quite a rare syndrome. So um, if you have received this as a diagnosis, the chances are you probably don't have it, but any one of any of the other number of causes that form up to gluteal syndrome. And that's why I've had to split this up into two distinct entities. So um, in this video, as we're focusing um, on it, I just want to say, first of all, this is of course going to be an informational video, nothing to do with self-help. Piriformis syndrome is defined as an irritation damage to the sciatic nerve as a result of pathology with the piriformis muscle. Now the clinical diagnosis of this is actually fairly unreliable because it's quite non-specific. There's lots of overlap of all these different causes, um, which we talked about in the deep gluteal syndrome video, and most of the um, causes really are probably lumbar in origin or relating to the hip itself, uh, but the main symptoms that people are going to be feeling are pain in the butt, as I mentioned before, it's usually unilateral, but can be bilateral, can occur to both, uh, both sides, but it's pain in the butt, it's radiating down the thigh, and it is made worse by a pressure being applied on it, and so people tend to find that they can't sit down for prolonged periods of time, you know, even relatively short periods, 20, 30 minutes might be a problem. And there may be various signs which are also associated with it. So obviously pain on deep palpation over the sciatic notch um, and also uh, various um, variations of the fair position where the hip is uh, flexed, adducted, internally rotated. And these are going to cause impingement and we'll just look at that in a moment. So um, just to um, have a look at the sciatic nerve anatomy over here. So the sciatic nerve passes in front of the piriformis muscle and then moves behind the other external rotators, the glomeruli muscles, as we've talked about previously. And so it can be pinched effectively um, by these muscles as the sciatic nerve goes um, along them. Now, in terms of the signs that we've uh, talked about, pain and, and uh, the fair position, there are several diagnostic tests um, which basically increase the tension um, of the muscles in that region and therefore put pressure on the sciatic nerve such that a positive result will either induce, reproduce or augment the pain that people are experiencing. So there are a number of different ones. So there's a straight leg raise sign or the SAG sign, uh, there's Pace's sign, Beatty's sign and Freiberg's sign. These are all various uh, variations um, of stretching the sciatic nerve. If you want to find out more about those, it's very easy to Google them. Um, especially here on YouTube. Um, and then there are variations of the fair position, um, where, as I've mentioned, the hip is flexed, adducted, so that means it moves um, inwards and then internally rotated. Now, this can either be done in an active way um, or it can be done in a passive way. And, um, you know, you can have a look at those as well. However, um, each of those tests are said to have a specificity of about 50% and in combination they're supposed to uh, be quite good. However, as I've said, there are lots of different structures in this area and it's very easy to cause discomforts from any of the causes relating to the bones, joints, tendons, muscles, ligaments, uh, that all are in this region and so they're all pretty unreliable. So how do you actually make a positive diagnosis? So the best way of doing it is by looking and to look the best way one would hope would be non-invasively using radiology of which there are a number of different options we've got ultrasound scanning uh, which is very good and then we've got uh, uh, MRI scans which it's either a straightforward MRI scan magnetic resonance imaging or MRN magnetic resonance neurography uh, one can actually look at this uh, these nerve fibers in, in quite some detail um, although of course that is a uh, very much a reserved group of studies. So really the mainstay of this is probably ultrasound followed by uh, MRI scans. And then 
if one can't make the diagnosis from those, sometimes it's only made at operation, whether it's um, an open operation or perhaps preferably laparoscopically where it's done through keyhole surgery. There's also nerve conduction tests, which we'll talk about in a, a bit later on, but basically the mainstay of making the diagnosis is actually using radiology. One of the interesting things when one considers the radiological findings where one's either finding hypertrophy, that swelling of the piriformis muscle or atrophy where it shrinks down, um, is this kind of third group of options is where there are anatomical variants. So this is one of the first big controversies uh, relating to um, the actual disease processes um, involved in piriformis um, syndrome. And so, um, about 85% of people will have a pretty straightforward uh, course of the sciatic nerve being a single structure that passes in between the piriformis uh, muscle and then the other external um, rotators uh, beneath it. There are other types as well, so the other types of anatomical variation, so about 85% of this type 1, it's a standard type, um, about 13% or so is this type 2, and the rest is made in fractions of percentages whereby the sciatic nerve is divided in other ways. Now, there was a, a wonderful study uh, done by um, Adam Bartrett and his colleagues where they looked at hundreds of um, MRIs of people's hips taken for all sorts of reasons and basically uh, they've managed to put to bed the concept that um, anatomical variations are a cause of piriformis syndrome because they didn't find any differences in the number of patients who had piriformis syndrome and these other anatomical variations or those who ended up having pains and discomforts and so on. If you want to find out more about um, that paper, you can uh, have a look at it um, online, but really a wonderful paper and that's basically put this to bed. In terms of the next level of controversy and debate is what the role of neurophysiology is in terms of making a positive diagnosis using dynamic testing and seeing if that can functionally impair the sciatic nerve. And so this is done using the H reflex in the fair position and there has been considerable discussion about this um, and its utility within our trade journal Muscle and Nerve and if you are super interested in that then I would direct you to those relevant papers. In terms of the next controversy is well how do we classify piriformis syndrome and one generally uh, classifies things as either primary or secondary and how one classifies you know how one defines primary or secondary um, again is something which is very debatable I like to keep things simple um, I would say that the primary form of piriformis syndrome is a classical type um, whereby uh, there's a problem with the piriformis muscle in of itself not terribly understood why that should occur but it's a problem within the piriformis muscle itself um, and that's causing irritation to the sciatic nerve as a result we've now already put to bed the anatomical uh, variations which were said by some to be primary causes um, but um, in terms of uh, you know the classic piriformis syndrome I think it'd be fair to say that we'll, let's just call that primary and then the secondary piriformis syndrome and again people may debate you know what macro trauma and micro trauma you name it but in terms of things which are identifiable in terms of radiological causes um, certainly um, in the literature there are reports of infections tumors of a variety of forms or iatrogenic trauma uh, going on maybe secondary causes of piriformis syndrome. Now, of course, we've already talked about the fact that um, the symptoms of deep gluteal syndrome, or piriformis syndrome, however one comes to its ultimate definition, um, is in the community um, is much larger, as a, as a larger cohort of patients than those who come into hospital. And as we said in the previous one, a, a variety of large teaching hospitals uh, and facilities um, the number of cases per year reaching secondary care for further investigation is actually pretty small. We said about 20 per year in, a, in four different hospitals. And so um, the true um, incidence of primary and true incidence of secondary piriformis syndrome is really unknown. So that's quite an important 
point to consider when one has the secondary causes um, and which are probably overrepresented um, in the literature but the sensible approach is is that if someone has actually ended up in secondary care for whatever reason uh, whether conservative treatment has failed um, the symptoms are particularly painful um, or whether there's a, a rapid progressive uh, process going on the most sensible thing to do is of course to image and to image um, literally the entirety of the sciatic nerve I would recommend um, in order to make sure one isn't missing anything. In terms of treatment obviously one wants to try and treat the underlying cause and that's why imaging is so important so if there's a primary cause or whether there's a secondary cause obviously if the secondary causes those need to be addressed directly for the primary causes the mainstay is going to be conservative therapy there's a whole variety of different treatments at different levels so in terms of community settings things such as ultrasound um, might be uh, helpful then there are some more invasive type of things such as transrectal massage apparently um, and dry needling and then there are things such as local anaesthetic injections, local steroid injections, which are known to be relatively short-lived. And then there's Botox therapy, uh, which may be helpful as well. And people may find themselves escalating from one thing to the next. And of course, for people who fail with one type of intervention, there are other interventions. But the ultimate one is actual surgical decompression, which I presume a minority of patients will wind up receiving um, if they failed all other options. So that's it in terms of piriformis syndrome. So we've talked about a number of the controversies relating to this. Um, it definitely, I'm sure it definitely does exist. I personally haven't yet seen a true piriformis in its pure sense um, in my personal practice. Um, I'm sure others have. I have no doubt about that, um, but it's a very rare syndrome and I thought it'd be worthwhile exploring that with all of you. So I hope you've enjoyed the information I've uh, put here in this video. I appreciate that it might be frustrating for quite a few of you actually if you have been given this as a diagnosis and um, it's just important to bear in mind that it may not be uh, what, uh, you know, this, the symptoms that you're experiencing may not actually have the label that you have been given um, but there is treatment out there and certainly um, results for quite a few of these interventions in appropriately selected patients have been reported as positive although you know some people may need to escalate up all the way to surgical decompression so thanks for watching i hope you found it helpful um, and insightful if you have please do support the channel by liking sharing and subscribing and i look forward to seeing you in the next video shortly